Titel. No, it is English. Our next talk is the title Architecture of Secure IoT Devices, Security by Design. Uh, our speaker Freiburg will talk about the different steps, technologies and methods that you shall uh, apply and that will help you to build a secure by design device or system. Um, Freiburg is a freelancing software developer with quite a bit of experience in the field of security. Um, yeah. Please welcome for you, round of applause. Hello. OK. Uh, welcome to everybody uh, to the presentation of Architecture of Secure IoT Devices. Um, so I've been introduced already, so I skip this. Um, the intended audience is uh, or are uh, current users of Raspberry Pi and who might be interested in or thinking about how could I achieve to get a secure IoT system. So w w what's necessary to, to get to the next level? And uh, I've got, I'm sorry to tell you that the first step you've got to do is to, you've got to switch the hardware because the Raspberry Pi will not be sufficient or the right hardware to, to implement this functionality and this architecture I'm presenting here. So what you need is um, an NXP IMX6 or an, a newer version of the NXP processor family, uh, ARM Cortex A7. Um, and it has usual features, so this, this board is a bit older, it's uh, 10 or 100 mega, megabit per second Ethernet, USB 2, um, serial devices, I2C, CAN, GPIOs. And the important fact is secure JTAG, if users and CAM. So that, that's, these are the aspects that allow us to implement a secure IoT device. Uh, we will talk later about what is the secure IoT device. We will have a look at a small example and uh, discuss so what our requirements, what, are our, uh, what do we want to achieve. Uh, we will talk a bit, little bit about the risk and threats. Uh, how do we achieve a secure boot on our IMX6, uh, encrypted partitions, uh, and additional isolation te te techniques to separate uh, applications from each other. Um, we will talk about a little bit about organization. So if you are in a company and you start to set up a uh, secure IoT system, um, first you will start to, to, to implement your PKI in the, as a development team and so on, and then later you ask yourself, okay, who's responsible now for the PKI, PKI uh, infrastructure? So who will manage it? It's not the developer. So it should be IT service in your, in your company. And uh, this, this, uh, so having this thought, um, there are some organizational aspects you, we have got to talk about. So we will have a short, very sh or simple example. We will have a, uh, our example is a charging station. Um, and here, that's uh, the charging station. And it's used to charge a car. It can interact with an RFID card. Uh, and it's connected to, uh, to the operator, to the data center of the operator. It receives system updates, it sends, it receives control messages, it's, it's sending up data. So the data could be uh, the, the amount that has been charged by a car and so on. So important for billing, so quite important data. Um, we can split this apart into four stages, a sen sensor, actuators, their internet gateways, oops, internet gateways. Um, we have got edge IT. In our case, we don't have any edge IT, and the data center cloud. Um, this one here is our device, uh, which is connected to uh, the car using uh, and, uh, to sensors and. Uh, um, um, so, um, encrypting the data and sending it over to the data center. Uh, we also have um, some uh, technician 
working on the spot and configuring the system locally. So we need some kind of secure connection to our device. Um, we need a secure uh, system update transport. Let's assume we use HTTPS. Um, we need a remote control connection that could be HTTPS or it could be SSH. And we've got a data upload uh, using HTTP, but it could be also kind of VPN network. We have got a local database here, storing all local data and uh, for visualization and being uploaded to the data center on this side. Uh, on the data center side, we have got an update service, um, some facility receiving the data uploads, PKA infrastructure, some kind of, oops, some kind of, oh, and uh, kind of DNS. Um, so when we analyze the risk now, there are some met uh, methodologies uh, that should be used. Uh, and uh, so there is the BSI 100 standard or the ISO 27,000. Uh, uh, 27, and um, so, Important fact is also so they, they define a process how you analyze certain risks and threats. And um, it's also important, so the BSI standard defines the important Grundwerte or Schutzbedarf and Grundwerte, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So in these three aspects will be our um, so uh, our targets we want to achieve here. Um, so there is one mantra, so security cannot be introduced in afterthought. So we have got to think about security from the beginning. We cannot develop a system and attach security later. So we have got, it's, it's uh, in our, it must be in our system from, from the first startup. And influences device boot times, file system performance, firmware upgrade processes. Um, so if we, if we go back to our example, so we have got um, this um, system update being transferred from our data center or from portal to our device. So here we would need some mutual, mutual authentication. So we need a client certificate, we need a server certificate. Um, talking about remote control, Again, so we need a, a client certificate connecting to the, to the target, to the device, and we need a server certificate on the device. For data uploads, it might be VPN, so we need, a, uh, we need, a, we need a mutual authentication, we need client certificates, uh, server cert uh, certificates. We've got the database, so the database should be encrypted. And as you see here, so it's full of security and, and requirements um, for uh, cryptographic items, credentials, you name it. Um, we will talk about fuse bits also. We will talk about uh, secure boot uh, and code signing. Um, and maybe some words about DNSSEC, trust anchor. So, having a look at the organization of your company, so you might have, so it's a bit, uh, I did it with another tool, so it's not, it's not as fine as it looked before, before I used, copied it. Um, so we have got the development department here, developing or implementing some code, and to execute or to, 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 to uh, realize some kind of secure boot, this code must be signed. So we need some mechanism to sign the code. Could be used, it could be done within the development center, or uh, development team, but if we do so, the development team, team is responsible to keep these data secret. And it's the most important data of the company. So if this data gets lost, uh, anybody could compile code and uh, sign it with those credentials and deploy it on the hardware. So this is the most important aspect uh, of a secure system, that these credentials are kept very secret. 
So we, knew we should establish some kind of code signing service within the company. So sending, so, authentic, so developers are authenticating against a service, maybe with a username and password, or maybe with a, some kind of uh, cryptographic credentials, to get access to the code signing service. Um, so we, need, we also need um, credentials, credentials, keys that are stored on the target during, when we, uh, during production, when we um, commission the, the device and uh, send it out for delivery. Um, the operation support and incident uh, response team needs keys to access the devices. So again, so it's uh, all around in your company suddenly a requirement for security credentials, security items pop up. And you need uh, within your company some kind of um, understanding and support to get this, these services um, delivered by the IT service department. So, um, important steps also to choose the right hardware. Um, so in this case, so I have experience with this NXP IMX6 Ultralight, it's an ARM Cortex. It has 250 megabyte, it's 4 gig uh, flash memory. Uh, it has an it's industrial grade, it's operating a wide range of temperature. Um, and so it's offered by the company Caro. And this company also offers uh, or more performant devices, but this device is sufficient for our need. Um, as I said, it has usual uh, features, uh, internet, USB, uh, serial device, CAM, GPIO. And the important, the important uh, aspects are the secure JTAG, eFuse, and this CAM, Cryptographic Accelerator Assurance Module. So let's have a look how these, these functionalities work together. Um, we want to establish a secure boot. Why? So we want to make sure that nobody else will be able to start code on our device except our code. So to, uh, to enforce this, we can um, set or code some fuse bits in our, in our uh, processor. These are called one-time programming. So once they are set, you can't modify them anymore. They are burned into, into your processor. What, you, and what is burned into your processor is the hash value of, of your public key. Of a public key, we will see later how it is used. But these, these hash values are just are the trust anchor of your public key. And the public key will be used to verify signature attached to your code. Um, this is the signature, this is the bootloader, and interesting aspect is the public key is also attached to, to your code. It will be, the whole image will be loaded by the, um, by the initial bootloader, it will extract the public key, it will hash the public key, it will verify that the, public, the hash of the public key matches the hash values burned into the, the CPU. And if this is fine, the public key will be used to, uh, to decrypt the signature, and the decrypted signature will be compared to a newly uh, uh, computed signature of the bootloader image a bootloader uh, execution code, executable code. Um, the so if public key or signature do not match, the CPU will not start up this code. And it will, it will do, so it will just uh, freeze. Nothing will happen. Um, so the process to create this um, a signed bootloader is you start with your bootloader, U-boot, you compute the hash, 
you take a private key, and the private key will sign the hash and the hash, and when you, when you ship your software, the signature is attached to the bootloader. So this is how a secure boot, or as, uh, as it's called in this environment, high assurance boot, is working. So this is an example how we can make use of this mechanism to establish a chain of trust during the boot phase. So we've got the, the ROM, uh, secondary uh, or second program loader, or well, there are multiple names for this, and the second program loader is performing exactly the step we, we, we analyzed before, we had a look at before. So it's uh, reading, reading the boot image, the bootloader, and verifying the signature. If the signature is fine, the bootloader will be started, and the bootloader itself now, U-boot, will read the, the kernel image, it will verify the kernel image, signature of the kernel image, and it's using the same mechanism, the CAM mechanism, we used before to verify the U-boot. Um, this step, the keys are locked, so it's not possible to use any other key now. Um, and also, once the kernel, the kernel has been verified, we can also verify the root file system. Um, the root file system, if you compile it with Yoctor, so it's maybe 10 or 10 mig, so minimum size 10, me 10 megabyte. Um, if you use a minimum or a small Debian setup, so you can reach 120 megabyte. Um, but still, so it's, it's a very fast process. Um, important note here is that Ubud supports some kind of some kind of external um, uh, elements or items. Ubud has something called environment. The environment is stored on the disk as a text file. It can be read, it can be written. So we must make sure that nobody is able to write something into this environment text file. So and we and, uh, we we make sure by integrating or embedding this environment file into the Ubud image. Uh, also the, uh, the, the device tree of Linux. So usually it's externally, it's stored on the, on the image. So we want to make sure that nobody is, uh, is able to modify this, this uh, de uh, device tree. So again, we have got to integrate it into Ubud. Um, the device tree later will be handed over to the kernel. So the kernel will read a verified device tree. Nobody was able to modify. So this way we get we get um, a very um, we get a trust of chain starting up our system, and nobody will be as long as nobody gets access to the code signing keys. Nobody will be able or anybody will be able to to start any code on our device on our hardware. And this is important because the next step we will have a look at how we establish some kind of encrypted file system or on this target. Um, so once we, we started our system, so we, we have got to, to remember um, the root file system has been signed. So we will not be able or we should never ever modify our root file system because this would modify the hash value of this root file system. So we are not able to store anything in our root file system. We've got to establish some kind of other mechanism to store data that should survive a reboot. Um, but on the other side, uh, some applications expect that they are able to write into the slash etc directory. So for this case, we establish some kind of overlay for our, file for our read-only file systems. So having these overlays, um, the the applications will be able to store volatile data in the, in the ETC directory. But on reboot, those data will be lost. 
Now we need uh, to establish some kind of encrypted storage or secure storage. We are able to modify and to, to store certain configuration data into. So in here we use another feature of the IMX6 CPU. Um, it's called uh, the master key, the CAA master key. So here the kernel itself has an adapter to interact with the CAA master key and, and uh, encryption functionality around this master key. So we are able to, uh, to, to, to encrypt and decrypt uh, a key blob. And the key blob could be, um, could be um, a key storage. And this key storage is used by the disk mapper, uh, device mapper daemon to initialize uh, the device mapper for an encrypted file system. So, as you see, there are two, two important aspects to establish secure IET system. It's, uh, first of all, the, the trust of chain of the bootloader and uh, the encrypted storage and also the, over, uh, the overlay file systems. Um, so when so everything everything starts with the uh, with the fuse bits we set in our uh, CPU. These fuse bits are set in a very early production process. So when we order some boards at Caro, these boards are delivered with those fuse bits already set. Beside fuse bits, we all also deactivate JTAG. We deactivate other devices. We deactivate uh, booting from external devices. So a lot of fuses has been set uh, in terms of security, and also these hashes and fuses to to set the hashes. Um, so that that means over the complete production cycle, we are not able to start any other so non-signed. Uh, bootloaders or kernels. So for, in every phase we have got to think about um, providing, providing uh, 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 the, 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 the right bootloader for this production phase with the, with the correct or with the, with the required functionality in kernel, the required functionality in rootfs. So it's not only that we add security before we ship our product, we have got to deal with security issues during the complete production cycle. So from starting from manufacturing the module, assembly, putting together all the parts, uh, add, attaching the battery, uh, attaching sensors, um, commission phase, um, so setting the serial number, and then delivering and uh, setting up uh, on, on, on the spot and during operations. It's also important to talk about um, the software updates. Um, so it's not possible to, to, um, to use any functionality like APT, Debian, uh, Debian, Debian package updates or whatever. So we've got to update our images completely. Um, Um, so, I talked about uh, I talked about the, um, the requirement for PKI credentials um, that cover um, the, the code signing, the um, or the remote control, update services, signing update packages. Um, so for all these. Features and tasks, we need some kind of credentials, PKI credentials. And um, so there are multiple choices you could do to establish a CA or a PKI infrastructure in your company. So you could use Let's Encrypt, for example. Um, but Let's Encrypt does not cover code signing certificates. Um, and um, those code signing is, um, it's, if you look in, in, into this, um, 
into the scripts into uh, so those code signing um, uh, tools they generate uh, keys using OpenSSL, but afterwards they are modified and uh, they are um, bundled together and uh, so they, they require a certain structure. So Let's Encrypt will not cover this functionality. Uh, also, Let's Encrypt will not be the right choice if you have got IoT devices located uh, in some kind of home area networks. Let's Encrypt will never issue a certificate to you for a uh, for device located in a home area network. Assuming there's some Fritz box or whatever, some um, DSL router uh, badly managed, and uh, so um, the Let's Encrypt would not be able to, to verify if this domain belongs to this user. Um, so it's, it's only of limited use, Let's Encrypt. So you could use self-hosted cryptic PKI. PKI. So um, with a few, so OpenSSL is able to, to generate and to, to, to generate certificates, uh, keys and create certificates. So it's, it's, it could be used to realize a complete uh, CA uh, being hosted in, in your company. Um, so, but it requires a some kind of understanding what the process is doing, what is good for, and uh, it requires a lot of knowledge most companies might not have internally. Um, so you could use a self-hosted PKI being managed by some professional service provider like MS, MS Server, a Microsoft server. Um, but this, this is a very costly solution. So. Um, in this case, every, every Microsoft server can deal only with a single CA. That's, uh, and so if you need a number of CAs, you end up with a lot of Microsoft servers you've got to manage and host. And, um, so it's, uh, then you've got to deal with um, um, online certificate, status, uh, protocol, uh, services, and so on. So, it's quite complex. So what's interesting is, so what I came across recently as uh, some kind of service, PKS service offered by a Nexus group. I'm not sure they, they offer it already uh, publicly, um, but um, this is, I think it's a good, um, it's in between. So it's, uh, you, you outsource the management of the PKI, uh, but you still you have got full control of your PKI and can do whatever you want and uh, issue certificates for, for, ever, for any region you want. Um, talking about PKI service, you need uh, OCSP, Online Certificate Startup Protocol, that's used by or will be used by your IoT device to verify if any certificate is still valid or has been revoked. You might, use, uh, might have need for certificate verification lists important and important uh, service certificate enrollment protocol. So there is EST enrollment protocol and there is a modification of this EST uh, co based on uh, constrained application protocols and a more ancient uh, simple certificate enrollment protocol formerly known as a Cisco enrollment protocol. Um, so Beside, beside all these PKI services, we've got also to talk about the, uh, the update service. Uh, I think that's one of the most important services on our device. So whenever we want to change anything, we might want to update the system. And an update, update, or changing the code is always a risk that an uh, attacker might, might interfere. Um, so we have got the update service, and we have got to move or, or ship our, our package, update package, to our target. And um, often, so what I see sometimes is that people are doing it the wrong way. So um, they create some kind of tar file containing uh, the images, containing some kind of signature, um, and then they start to untar this, this package, and afterwards they verify the signature. So that's the wrong way. You should 
First steps always, if you receive any data, verify the signature of this data. Otherwise, if you start to untar this package, it might be a tar or zip bomb or whatever. So it might, uh, might, uh, might be a denial of service attack to, to, to kick your system out. Um, so first, first step always, having an, an, uh, dealing with update packages, is verify the signature. Um, once you once you, you you received an update package, you want to um, to replace an existing system with new images. And um, going back a few slides, th uh, I was talking about confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So we must make sure that any kind of update mechanism even if it fails or if some, someone pulls the plug or if, if it's, um, so if it's, uh, the update process is interrupted, it should never be any system or the, the system could, should not be bricked. It should always be possible, a fail-safe mode possible. So the system will realize um, that uh, the, 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 act, the active image is not working and should fall back and should fall back to the uh, recovery system or the previous image uh, that ran before properly. Yeah. So I had a look at Ubot and I think even with, so um, I didn't, so I analyzed it a little bit and I think it would be possible even with Ubot to create such, uh, such mechanism. So I know it works with, um, with Grub but uh, Grub is not in our focus right now. So, but I think it would be possible to, to implement uh, Ubot uh, to, and, or to, to configure Ubot a way that we've got some kind of fail-safe uh, boot process. Uh, of course, you see here um, a variable, active. So active is uh, the zero system, shall be the active one. Of course, this would, or it would be necessary to sign this data as well. So we would uh, juggle with kind of scripting in Ubot, and those scripts being signed itself, and just replacing one script by another script. So. Maybe if you've got experience with those scripting, you can tell me later if it's working, as I think. But so, um, so additional features. So I've got to speed up now. Um, you should remove any interpreter from your from your device. No Bash, no Python, no no J, no JS. So uh, focus onto a single D bus or a single single IPC mechanism. Um, Think about isolating access to GPIOs or other hardware devices. Um, define what is the well, what is the allowed message flow between devices. Who is allowed to write files? Who is allowed to read files? Uh, so the simple tasks. Um, do we need a firewall? Um, do we need isolation sandboxing of, of the baseband of the, um, the uh, for the cell phone? Um, USB 3 nowadays is using DMA, so USB 2 in the past did not use uh, uh, direct memory access. So USB, USB 3 is using direct memory access. So once you attach a USB 3 device, it might happen that it uh, directly transfers data physical from one physical region to another region, reading your data. Uh, Firewise, the same problem. So anything with DMA is, is, uh, is evil. So avoid any, any, any device using DMA uh, underneath. Um, so there are multiple uh, mechanisms you could partition or isolate your systems. You could use the uh, Unix groups. Um, you could use some C groups, uh, SLinux, name, established namespaces. Um, on, you could use a kernel virtual machine, Docker virtual box. You could use a trust zone feature called um, um, OPT or L4 microkernel. So, um, so usually Unix groups. So this is this is a Unix system. So we'll skip this. 
Um, the next step would be using C groups namespaces. So a good, good way to ice or to establish or manage C groups is using systemd on your, on, your, on your system. So systemd makes it very easy to, to define C groups, to define access to certain network devices, um, to restrict memory usage, and so on. So it's, it's very handy. Um, KVM or Docker, somehow they uh, make use of C groups and other namespaces and other functionality. This would be the next level to isolate, your system, or to isolate certain tasks. Um, but it's not sufficient to isolate DMA, DMA access. So it's still running on top, on top of your operating system, Linux. And Linux uh, has a, um, is of 60 million lines of code. So it's quite a big system, and it's not possible to verify if, if they, if they might, if, um, to, to verify the system. Um, OPT is, um, would be the next level in regarding complexity and security. So OPT is um, something like um, a microkernel running uh, a site in a, in a called trust zone and uh, the rich operating um, oper the rich OS rich operating system is triggering a call into this uh, trust zone executing certain um, secure and uh, cryptographic operations and you uh, get uh, back the result so this this is well established mechanism it's uh, possible to integrate this into the u boot boot process um, what would be even better would be if the hardware would be um, designed for this. So, for example, certain devices should only, be, or GPIOs should only be accessible from within the trust zone, running within the OPT, um, the trusted execution environment. Um, so, but most hardware nowadays does not have this um, wiring on the board. Um, so. That would be a nice feature, but in most cases it's not uh, realized, so hardware is not, it's not supporting this. Um, so there are just a few ways you could use a boot into the Opti, the trusted environment. Another very interesting way to isolate um, tasks and um, application is using an L4 microkernel. Oh, it's a family of microkernels. So I work with L4 uh, Rio Fiasco. Um, so it's capa capability-based uh, runtime. And during startup, you define who is allowed to send message to which to which application. So you might have. Um, so you've got the microkernel here, And uh, so this microkernel has only 60,000 lines of code, so it's much easier to verify uh, this code. And the capability system allows you to uh, define communication patterns between tasks. And um, the interesting point is that those capabilities can be handed over from one task to another task if there are permissions. So it's, in this way, it's very easy to establish communication channels between tasks, but also dynamically extend those channels. So if you start dynamically a Linux uh, kernel, th this Linux kernel might get, uh, might receive certain capabilities and being able to access memory, to access certain uh, USB devices, and so on. So L4 would be the right choice if you want to restrict access to certain devices. The problem is that this kernel is, is, uh, is uh, tailored especially for your hardware. So if you change the hardware later, you start again from, the, from scratch and uh, um, bring, bring L4 and your system up on the new hardware. Problem is also if you've got a chip or hardware which has a single interrupt but serving two functionalities, USB and maybe modem. So then it's very hard to separate those, those two functionalities from each other. Um, what we did in another project was uh, we, had, um, we had the need to do some kind of um, um, 3D, 3D acceleration. 
and um, so some guy managed to implement a governor and to uh, for the 3D accelerator um, so allowing to two tasks or two partitions on our system to use uh, to make use of this of this 3D accelerator well, that was really cool um, so that's almost the end so we talked about we talked about um, um, we talked about uh, a, st a charging station located on a, on, on a parking lot, having uh, being accessible uh, over a public IP. Um, the fully qualified domain name is uh, can be resolved, and we can access the device. So, what will change if we move our st charging station now into our house, into our home area network? So suddenly we've got the problem I, m I mentioned with let's encrypt. So we will not be able to get any um, um, or, or no public CA will issue a, a certificate for our device. Um, and that's a problem if we, if we have some kind of uh, graph, uh, user interface for the user uh, who bought this charging station and he wants to manage this this charging station and um, but so he, this user has has the, 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 the choice between entering a user and password at a web page in plain text and transferring it plain text or accepting some kind of self signed certificates being deployed on the target but if you do so the user will also always see a warning. So once he tries to, to access this device with HTTPS, the browser will always warn him that this is an unsecure connection, a self-signed uh, connection, untrusted. He should uh, store or ask him if he trusts this, this uh, server. Uh, so it's, it's very annoying, this. this. Uh, if you, so if you try to... to um, establish some kind of security for an IoT device located in a home area network. This, you have got to struggle with this problem. Another problem is if you move your IoT device into a home area network, some services might not be usable, so you might not be able to use DNSSEC anymore. It might be blocked by the router of the user. You might not be able to use certain kinds of, uh, vo uh, of um, VPN connections. So it's uh, a lot of limitations in your home air network. And um, regarding this HTTPS problem and self signed certificates, I asked some guys from um, Chrome and they told me that they don't have any solution for this. So, and, um, so it's a bit annoying because you know, a web page would be is a nice access or user interface to manage your IoT device. And um, if there is any solution, so I'm I would be happy to get to know about it. So that's the end of my presentation. So we had a look at the architecture of a secure IoT device. We talked about uh, secure boot, how the functionality of the underlying hardware is used to establish a chain of trust uh, during the boot phase. Once we are booted, uh, how we establish encrypted storage, how we deal with the read-only partitions um, uh, we booted from. And um, yes, so I thank you. Thank you, Freiburg, for your talk. Uh, if you happen to have any questions, we have about two minutes left. Uh, if you would like to ask a question, please find any of the, um, yeah, go ahead. Microphone intro. Thanks for your talk. Uh, first of all, small remark. Maybe it is useful to pay attention to kernel hardening uh, measures and 
uh, user space protection measures, how you build your software uh, using your tool chain, uh, which is f further used on your device. And a small question. Uh, I didn't understand how this encryption uh, container helps in your attack model. Could you describe it, please? Um, which one do you mean? Uh, the last slide. The last L4 kernel? Uh, the last slide, uh, if you show it. So. This one? N further. No. No. It was a recap. The yes. So you have this encrypted storage and how it helps you and uh, what, what is the purpose of it? Um, so encrypted storage is an encrypted file system. Um, as the other file systems are read-only, we have no way to store any data. So if, if an IP address is configured or username or uh, some kind of um, for, for us, IoT device, some functionality configuration, so we've got to store it somewhere. So the encrypted source is intended for this. And so why, it might be using DHCP, yes or no, fixed static IP address, uh, what is the DNS server, and so on. And why encrypted that, but not storing it uh, unencrypted? So uh, what do you protect uh, if the devices um, ah, yeah. Attacker yeah, has access not, to it. It's, it's not only the IP address. You're right. So it's 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 also it's. We talked about a lot of um, um, HTTP creden HTTPS credentials, uh, public. Uh, so a client client certif a client key client certificate. So client key VPN uh, keys maybe to to open a VPN session, and so on. Uh, these should not be. So they should be. Uh, Configurable. They should not be. The 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 the, the file systems are um, are read only, but readable. They are just signed. So this extended three. The encrypted storage is to protect also those credentials that should not be readable, accessible by anybody else, getting access to the flash memory. Yeah. Sorry. So I didn't right. I didn't uh, put it into the slides. Thank you, Freiburg, for your answer, and I'm afraid we're out of time. Uh, please, some applause for Freiburg for giving this talk. Okay.